Mad God is a 2022 stop-motion passion project written, directed, and all-around created over the course of 30 years by Phil Tippett as his directorial debut. This tale follows a man known only as the Assassin as he descends through a world of horror, despair, and monsters. Will he reach his target, and just what is his target? Will we even find out what is happening in this macabre special effects extravaganza? One can only wonder how twisted is the mind of Tippett, and what monstrosities will his fingers craft? Reviewing this film is going to be a little more difficult compared to my usual form of reviewing, for a few reasons I'm sure will become apparent. One difference is the fact that Tippett took the LEGO Star Wars route of no one talks, save for what can only be described as gibberish and grunts. So this is an 85 minute movie with basically zero dialogue, however I love Mad Max The Road Warrior, and it has limited dialogue, and I do enjoy LEGO games. So anyways, let's dive in the Mad God. The film immediately lives up to its title as we open with what I believe is the Tower of Babel. For those unaware, the story is basically people united under one language tried building a tower to survive Flood 2.0. However, God didn't like this and struck them with different tongues, thus no one understood the other. And this is where we get languages from. So after a smoke screen, Tippett reminds us he worked on Star Wars via literal text crawl. The text here is Leviticus 26, 27 through 33. Basically, from what I learned on a crash course of Leviticus, it's God says good Jews who follow my teachings will get these blessings, and those Jews that defy will get these curses. Oh, and credit be where it's due, because these literally read like the lyrics to an Infant Annihilator song. Listen to The Kingdom Sitteth Lonely Beneath Thine Hallowed Heavens, and tell me they couldn't make this stuff into an awesome song. Oh, and the bit about you shall eat the flesh of your sons was because God's promised curse would cause such a severe famine that sons and daughters would be eaten by their parents. Interestingly, Jewish historian Joseph did describe cannibalism inside Jerusalem when the city was put under siege by the Romans in 70 AD, the most notable being when he described a woman killing and then eating her own baby son. Afterwards, we literally dive down into the Terminator's future war. After his initial warm welcome, the assassin descends further past fossils and relics. While this is a claymation character, the voice actors supplying grunts and such, or at least the puppeteers, I'm not really sure, are as follow. David Lawyer, Jake Freytag, and Hans Breck. The assassin exits the pod and moves through the horrific yet beautifully done environments. We get a glimpse at just how brutal the world is when a disfigured creature utilizing a bell to lure, kill, and eat a rat only in turn becomes the victim of another horrific creation. There is also this scene straight out of Silent Hill 2. While I'm not sure what exactly is going on, I know from this film's description vaguely what the goal is. He is the assassin, he has a target somewhere, and the world is a twisted, nightmarish hellscape. I mean, some things connect, like these human fry dates, who, while being electrocuted, shit into a pipe that works its way down to a skull, indulging in said shit. Excuse me, uh, the, uh, the fuck did you just say? Moving right along, we get the lives don't matter scene, as workers toil away, only to be nonchalantly killed off by flying objects, fat exposed, whip equipped monstrosities, and even trains. It all once again looks spectacular, with animation being the smoothest I've ever seen. I don't even think they utilize CGI to smooth out the jitters. However, the best way to describe my feelings during all of this is basically if you watched a Dark Souls intro with no narration, just music and cool visuals. Oh, and there's this strange baby voice thing going on. One of the workers takes an interest in the assassin, but with the boss coming around the corner, he continues, pausing only to watch the worker be beaten to death. Down the flight of stairs, the assassin finds his goal. In a room filled with suitcases, he removes his own and arms the bomb. But in the words of Steven Seagal, What's wrong with you, man? You're slipping. But you can't check your six. <laughs> B 
beaten, he is dragged off, and the bomb seems to malfunction. So that was Mad God, a strange yet hypnotically beautiful passion project of a short film. Being only 30 minutes, it didn't oversay its welcome, and it... Wait, what? You mean it's still 55 minutes? Okay. Well, if you weren't confused or disturbed, we get a theater performance. The star is our assassin, who is chained down and knocked unconscious via injection. Then two big guys strip him down to the crowd's laugh track. The scene fades, and we are then shown that he is alive, though wrapped entirely in bandages. The surrounding rooms also have similar bodies to his, making you wonder if he is the first one sent down here. His situation worsens as our second set of live-action actors enter the scene. The first were these two known guys, but I kind of skipped over them because it was like a 10-second scene. But anyways, this is Arnie Hain as the surgeon, and Nikita Roman as the nurse. Though one Satish Rataconda is also listed as a surgeon, so I don't know. Possibly one was a surgeon in the show, and this is the other. These actors move with a jitter that makes them appear more stop motion than the actual claymation on display. They probably did try and do the actors frame by frame, which does lend to the fear and confusion of the assassin. However, if that wasn't the goal, it both shows how well done the claymation is, and how out of place the stop motion with the live actors is. Anyhow, the assassin is ripped open and looted. Strange organs and other fleshy bits are tossed aside, along with gold coins, jewelry, bracelet, and even books and papers. Meanwhile, he's awake, suffering through it all, unable to move anything other than his one eye. With the strange in style now twisted completely off, the last thing removed from the assassin is some sort of slug child. The nurse wraps the child in a blanket and leaves the room. So after that cavity search, the assassin is surely dead, right? Nope, they got a drill into his head like he's in the Apostle. For all the symbolism in this film, I at least understood this part. They shove a light slash scope instrument into his brain, and it's symbolic of them searching his memory. I think. Because then we dissolve to a man who has lost his clippers when the nukes fell, being besieged. Again, this all looks amazing, and like something out of a Metallica or Iron Maiden music video, but I'm rather confused, and mostly just long for the ride at this point. The besiegers then start screaming and hollering at the man who retreats inside. Credited as the last man, and played by Alex Cock, we watch him prepare in ritualistic clothing and gather a map constructed by three crones. Going with the map into a large room filled with men who look just like the assassin, he hands the map off. Still believing this is a flashback, I figured this was the assassin initially being sent down. My logic for why I think that, despite the slightly different clothing and different map, will be brought up soon. The assassin here has a much easier time as not only is transportation found twice over, but he witnesses strange creatures fighting, prostitution, but all the while is rather unmolested. The area he traverses are even more lit and less dark than what the film opened with. He then drives through an ongoing battle that culminates in nukes off in the distance. Driving down a winding descent, we dissolve back into the operating room. Now I figure this was the same as the assassin lying dead due to the dissolves, the mind searching, and figured the clothes map degradation was due to how long he survived, not to mention we don't see either assassins for the remainder of the film. But anyways, what about the nurse and the baby? Well, she goes before this awesome looking mofo, the whole time he's emitting what sounds like some kind of Bible verses or Latin, I'm not really sure. Point is, he extends his creep hands, and the nurse hands the baby over. Oh, and while everything looks spectacular, the hands in this short bit look the worst as they sway side to side after unfurling in a way that looks very rubbery, for lack of a better word. Nurse goes to take a little nap, but is awakened by the baby's crying as it is taken away. Now it's awesome and all that watching this plague doctor walk and I truly want to see how the physics of the cloth trailing behind him was done, but with only 25 minutes of this film left, this is where the pacing is just kneecapped. I mean, everything else up to this point felt like 30 minutes, maybe 40, but I was interested and wanted to find answers. Maybe it was because this film can feel like an endurance test and it had begun to wear me down or something. But this segment where we watch the alchemist toil about and screw with his pets just drags so much. 
I legit felt like this portion of the film lasted an hour. The worst part is, it's all pointless. Multiple parts of the film could be described as that, but this specific bit of the film really dragged and lacked any meaning. Luckily, the amazing effects of the Plague Doctor step in the hand off the child, which the alchemist wastes no time in pulping, making into an ingot, and finally crushing into fine gold and jewels. The Plague Doctor then casts it all into fire, which may or may not be because of the nuke seen by the alchemist a moment ago. We watch the supposed creation of Earth and life being born, stuff being built, and finally two anarchists setting a bomb that looks exactly like the one the assassin was using. The film then ends on the eyeball that started it. Anyways, that was Mad God, and before I get into the details, I want to say that this story is very open to interpretation, mainly due to a lack of information than anything else. Now, Wikipedia has a plot synopsis that upon reading contradicts what I thought was happening. First was that the assassin we see driving is claimed by the article to be a second assassin and not the prior assassin. I'm still not sure, due to stuff like the brain searching, his ascent showing that the world continues to deeper depths, when he arrives it's light out so I figured the assassin merely secured in their pod to dive deeper and that is why the opening of the film is so dark. The only connection apart from different clothes is the fact that he sees nukes and then later the alchemist sees nukes in the distance. Secondly, the plot synopsis claims that the cavity search scene items are metaphors for secrets of war and such. I guess at that as at that point it's a good enough explanation. The third difference is the ending. Now Wikipedia claims it's a creation of a new world and galaxy doomed to repeat and suffer the same fate. But I took an almost comical if cynical view of it. I figured it was showing the past, the creation of the world, and what caused it to initially collapse. This is explaining all the same briefcases the assassin sees when planting his own. It shows that at the so-called height of the world, we destroyed ourselves, and at our worst, we continue to destroy ourselves. All those briefcases were prior bombs between the initial one set by the anarchist and the final, or at least most recent one, set by the assassin. Another theory I have seen is that it's the insanity idea from Far Cry 3 where everyone's doing the same thing, expecting different results, but getting the same damn results. Which would mean it was a continuous chain of assassins being sent down to try and blow the place up, failing, having their lizard baby thing being crushed in the dust, and then another world created which also failed. That was, that would be what that theory would suggest. Oh, I should mention that at the end all the clocks act wonky, so yeah, maybe bomb go boom. But anyways, Mad God is a film that Tippett spent 30 years making. He began work on it post Robocop 2 in 1990, and considered abandoning it after working on Jurassic Park in 1993. His reasoning was he figured CGI would replace stop motion completely. However, with some urging, he opened up a Kickstarter in 2000 AD and proceeded to finish the project. While he did a lot of work, he did utilize students on the weekends who were looking to gain film experience. While there was usually a clear distinction between actors in stop motion, there were some actors in puppet suits for certain scenes. The Mountain of Dead Soldiers was done by melting thousands of little army men together on a wire. It took six people three years to complete the scene. In the first quarter of the film, one can spawn ED-209. Now prior to its official release, there were three shorts that roughly made up half the film. Maybe in our 30 years we'll get a full movie or even a game of Mutant Land. Seriously, I could see that being an old school RPG like Fallout 2. Now, the film first premiered in Switzerland, 5th of August 2021, at the Locarno Film Festival. Its latest release to date is here in the USA on Shudder, 16th of June 2022, with a future release planned in Poland on the 13th of July 2022. The film is universally known as Mad God, though it has also been called Phil Tippett's Mad God. I've been being around the bush long enough, did I or did I not enjoy this film? I appreciate the absolute beauty and technical wizardry on screen. I dare say every frame could be a picture to an almost literal degree. If this were the last hurrah for stop motion, then on a purely art form level it succeeds. However, as beautiful as a frame can be, it needs something more to connect to the viewer. And that is where Tippett fails. The assassin was easy enough to support, I suppose, but not one character got deeper than they look cool, 
The term style over substance, or better yet, all style no substance, fits this film like a glove. For all the marvel the visuals produced, nothing truly latched me into the world or its inhabitants. I dare say that if it were not for the stop motion and claymation being used to impress, I would forget this world among any other art form such as CGI or live action. Beauty is only skin deep after all. I cannot recommend this film to anyone other than those that love stop motion, practical effects, or such. I will admit I can see us landing in some film school where some snob of a teacher parades around claiming to hold the meaning of the grail within its frames. To be clear, none of this is hatred towards Mr. Tippett. In fact, I applaud him for his endeavor and am happy to have seen his craftsmanship. However, I feel this film would have worked wonders more as a short film, a series of music videos, or even something more akin to heavy metal or The Wall. Now, this confused narrative is apparently based off Tippett's depression and nightmares. If he were to make a sequel, he's considering adding more of a narrative, which I would actually like to see. Even with that, I don't think this film is worth the watch unless you truly love the art form of stop motion and claymation. Maybe in a year or two I'll revisit this film and dive into the theories posed by others. Also, if not for the fact we were told, who would assume he's an assassin? He passes tons of machinery and plants a bomb. If not having read the description, I would have called him a saboteur. And now folks, it's time to say goodnight. We sincerely appreciate your patronage and hope we've succeeded in bringing you an enjoyable evening of entertainment. Please drive home carefully and come back again soon. Good night. <laughs>